Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Yesterday the news broke that US rocket engine developer Aerojet Rocketdyne would be acquired by Lockheed Martin for the sum of $4.4 billion. And I think this is worth talking about because Aerojet Rocketdyne pretty much cover all the rocket engines which were used for all the launches from, you know, starting in the 1950s going up to about 2010. I mean, they're still very much involved, but around 2010, SpaceX comes along and it's using its own engines. Rocket Lab now built their own engines. And of course, Blue Origin are also making their own engines. But Aerojet Rocketdyne pretty much have this massive history. So when we say Aerojet Rocketdyne, there's actually three different companies in there, right? There's Aerojet Rocketdyne and Pratt and & Whitney. And the oldest one of these in terms of the rocket engine development would be Aerojet, which began as an outgrowth of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And initially they were sort of building solid rocket motors, specifically JATO units to help, uh, rock, uh, to help planes take off from runways. So, you know, these are small solid rocket motors that you strap onto planes and it gets them off the runway more quickly. And they were very quickly incorporated into another company because the solid rocket motors, a critical part is the rubber binders that are used to make sure that your propellant holds together. And they got assistance from a company called the General Tire Company. And in 1945, General Tire acquired Aerojet and turns out that General Tire actually is the sort of overarching parent corporation that became Aerojet Rocketdyne. And General Tire also, it was just like your typical American big conglomerate. It diversified into everything. Like at one point they owned a bunch of TV stations and radio and RKO radio pictures. You know, if you've seen old movies, you might have seen that. But yeah, um, Aerojet would go on to develop liquid rocket engines. Probably most important is the AJ-10, which uh, was the upper stage for the Vanguard, right? That was the second US launch vehicle to make it into space. But the AJ-10 is one of those engines that just turned up everywhere. It's a pressure-fed hypergolic engine, and it became the upper stage to a bunch of early rockets. It was the service propulsion system for the Apollo spacecraft. They had two of them on the space shuttle, and the SLS... Uh, sorry, the Orion on the SLS is going to have another AJ-10. It still lives on today. Um, they also did the main engines and the second stage engines for the Titan. Those are the LR-87 and the LR-91. So anyway, that's Aerojet. Rocketdyne grew out of North American aviation. And just after World War II, they got the chance to start iterating on the German-designed rocket engines. And they built bigger and better engines that found their way into almost all the US launch vehicles. An important one, I guess, would be the A7, which was essentially a clone of the V2 engine, but bigger and better. That was used for the Redstone rocket, which of course launched Alan Shepard into space, the first US astronaut in space. But, you know, they also built the MA-1 engines, which were used on the Atlas, the S3D that were used on the Thor, and eventually the Delta II, or the Delta, yep. Uh, the H1 and the J2 and the F1, which were used on the Saturn, Saturn 1 and the Saturn 5. And for the space shuttle, they made the RS-25 main space shuttle main engines, these high efficiently staged combustion engines. And these are, of course, going to still fly. They're going to power the SLS. They also made the RS-68, which currently powers the Delta IV. Finally, in the 1960s, Pratt & Whitney got into the rocket business. They got a contract to build a high-efficiency upper-stage engine. They came up with the RL-10, which still flies today. The RL-10 is a very high-efficiency hydrogen-oxygen engine with an expander cycle. It's powered the Centaur, which flew on top of the Atlas, the Titan. It's going to fly on the Vulcan. It's flying. There's a version of the RL-10 that powers the Delta four and uh, it's going to fly on the SLS as well. So this is again a hist an engine with a lot of history. So how did all these companies come together? Well Rocketdyne kind of went through a bunch of different owners. It became part of Rockwell which then became part of Boeing and then Boeing sold Rocketdyne that became part of Pratt & Whitney. Then Pratt & Whitney spun off its rocket engines and Aerojet bought them to create 
Aerojet Rocketdyne, the company that we know today. And of course, by this point, Aerojet Rocketdyne has got rid of all the other stuff. They're no longer making car tires or in the media business. They are just a you know defense contractor making rocket engines. At least the rocket engines is what we know them for. And so that's what Lockheed Martin is paying $4.4 billion for. And so we come to today and basically all the historical rockets have used Aerojet rocket dyne engines. And now that's very much becoming not the case. The ULA, of course, have the Atlas V, and its first stage is powered by a Russian RD-180. The only Aerojet Rocketdyne engine that is currently powering a first stage is the RS-68 on the Delta IV, and there's only four flights of the Delta IV Heavy left. Now, granted, there's three cores for each Delta Heavy, so that's 12 engines, but that doesn't exactly sound like a huge um, concern going forward. When the Vulcan was being developed, they had the AR-1, which was in development. That was going to be like an American revision, an American version of the high-performance kerosene liquid oxygen engines that we've seen from Russia. So they would take the uh, oxidizer-rich stage combustion cycle and just add some 30 years of scientific progress on it and make something more awesome. But... It didn't ultimately convince everyone. They did get funding for it. They worked their way through it. But ultimately, the engine that was selected for the Vulcan was Blue Origin's BE-4, which is a methane engine. And it just goes to show you, Blue Origin haven't flown other, anything other than their little rockets. But they've convinced the, big, the second biggest launch provider now in the US that their next generation rocket needs to use this engine that's never been flown. And I'm going to say, it probably looks like the better bet. Another thing, by the way, is that the first stage on the Atlas V has strap-on boosters, solid rocket motors. And for a long time, those were the AJ-60s, again by Aerojet. But they've recently, they've begun transitioning over to Gem 63s, which are made by Northrop Grumman because they acquired, you know, Orbital ATK and Thiokol and everything. So the only rocket to look forward to with first stage engines by Aerojet Rocketdyne is SLS. And boy, is the US paying a lot of money for those engines. Right now, <laughs> based on the various contracts that have been written, we're talking $150 million per engine. Granted, a lot of that is because of restarting the production lines and re redesigning things, whatever. The, the price should come down, but at the same time, they did have 16 engines pretty much just laying around from the end of the shuttle program and they spent a lot of money to refurbish those. But you know, I, I don't get the idea that just because they're not powering the first stage boosters that they have no business. The RL-10 is going to be around for a long time. There's nothing that gets its level of efficiency, right? There was a problem, by the way, a lot of stories a few years ago about how the RL-10 was shockingly expensive, like $35 million was one uh, quote I heard. And that was largely because of a lot of labor-intensive fabrication from an old design. But, you know, they've brought that under control. They've used, you know, they've redesigned parts. They're using a lot of additive manufacturing, 3D printing. And yeah, it looks like the RL-10 is going to have a lot of life ahead of it. The, they don't just make those, they also make smaller rocket engines, right? All these little RCS thrusters that are going to be on the Orion spacecraft, on Starliner, those are all made by Aerojet Rocketdyne. So, you know, in terms of rocket engines, they're still going to be selling lots of them. And, you know, Aerojet Rocketdyne are more than just chemical engines. They also have, uh, you know, electric propulsion. They have, you know, they, they have... Hall effect thrusters and arc jets that are used on satellites. They're, they've developed the X3 Hall effect thruster, which apparently is now generating a thrust of about half a kilogram. Okay, that's like 10 times the thrust of any other electric thruster. They also make the radioisotope thermoelectric generators, which fly on missions like uh, Perseverance, so they're going to fly one to Titan. That's not a big market. It's very much made you know, on demand, and the material they get has to come from the US government anyway. But, you know, ultimately, I guess, Aerojet Rocketdyne is more than just a space vehicle development company. They are... <laughs> 
they make a lot of other stuff for the military. All those solid rocket motors, US military needs a lot of solid rocket motors for all sorts of applications. Um, it, I think if you look, NASA is like 25% of the revenue and they have a lot of revenue from other stuff. They just announced earlier this month that their new you know, hypersonic scramjet passed a year of testing and is easily producing something like you know, six or seven tons of thrust at high Mach values. So yeah, Aerojet Rocketdyne, it's, it is interesting that they're getting, they're being sold. Obviously Lockheed Martin is, thinks that it's a good deal. I mean, I'm sure, like, internally, the fact that Lockheed Martin is making the Orion capsule and now is essentially building all the tiny rocket engines for that in-house is nice for them. But really, they're more looking at the bigger bottom line, the, the other numbers, the sales to defense you know, contracts and everything. That's where Aerojet Rocketdyne is making most of their money. So yeah, um, it'll be interesting to see if this actually goes through. I'm sure it will, but it's another step in you know, consolidation within the US rocket industry. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.